see you all here. Now, should all have an order of service, the notices are on the back. Next week's service um, is at Hopkirk at 9.30 and Minto 11.15. There is still time to get your Blythewood shoe box in. Um, they have to be here <coughs> by next Sunday. Um, or with Gwen, or if you've even just got items to go in a shoe box, then either give them to myself or to Gwen next door to the manse. And there is also a collecting box in the post office if you want to donate any money to pay for the transport. <coughs> so it's all systems go to get those out the next week. week. On Thursdays, we are having a sing-along in the hall here, um, from two till three, led by Anne. And you don't have to be able to sing, um, it is just a bit of fun. And if you want to come along and even just listen, then feel free. Um, it's a nice, warm, welcoming space um, to be there. So everyone's welcome to join us two o'clock on Thursday. A week on Monday, the 24th of October, the Guild are having an afternoon cuppa in the hall here um, to raise money for their Guild project, Star Child. And again, you're all warmly invited. And just a reminder for the Kirk session that the next Rubers Hall Kirk session meets on Tuesday, the 1st of November at 7 o'clock. You'll see at the bottom we've got prayers. Um, Tomorrow in here we have the service, funeral service for the late Betty Uddert at 12.30. And some of you may have already heard that Bob Neal, who was an elder um, here for many years, sadly passed away. His funeral is going to be here on Wednesday the 2nd of November at 11 o'clock. And the final thing to tell you is that at the end of the service, the little jars of flowers um, will be looking for new homes. So under each jar there is a plastic bag. So you may take the flowers, put them in the plastic bag, leave the jar behind for future use and either give them to somebody that you feel will benefit from them or keep them for yourself and enjoy them and remember harvest. So let us worship God. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. And we'll sing together for joy now with the harvest hymn 229. We plough the fields and scatter. Hymn 229. <coughs>
Creator God, forgive our moments of ingratitude. The spiritual blindness that prevents us from appreciating the wonder that is this world. The endless cycle of nature, of death and life and rebirth. Forgive us for taking without giving, reaping without sowing. Open our eyes to see, our lips to praise, our hands to share. May our feet tread lightly on the path we tread, and our footsteps be worthy of following, for they lead to you. As part of nature's wondrous cycle of new birth, growth, fruitfulness and death, we rejoice in the creation of new life. For parenthood, the passing on of knowledge, for understanding and the wisdom of the years. We are grateful for those who have gone before, passing on to us our spiritual heritage. May our lives blossom as the apple tree in spring. May we become fruitful in thought and deed. And may the seed of love that falls to the ground linger beyond our time on this earth. We bless you, God of seed and harvest. And we bless each other, that the beauty of this world and the love that created it might be expressed through our lives and be a blessing to others. We join together in the words of prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, our power and the glory of the Brenda is going to come and read our first lesson. The first lesson is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 9 to 17. The Festival of Weeks reviewed. You shall count seven weeks. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put to the standing grain. Then you shall keep the festival of weeks to the Lord your God, contributing a free will offering in proportion to the blessing that you have received from the Lord your God. Rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female slaves, the Levites resident in your towns, as well as the strangers, the orphans, and the widows who are among you, at the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and diligently observe these statutes. The Festival of Booths reviewed. You shall keep the Festival of Booths for seven days, when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your winepress. Rejoice during your festival, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female slaves, as well as the Levites, the strangers, the orphans, and the widows resident in your towns. For seven days you shall keep the festival to the Lord your God, at the place that the Lord will choose. For the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce, and in all your undertakings, and you shall surely celebrate. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, at the festival of unleavened bread, at the festival of weeks, and at the festival of booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. All shall give as they are able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Brenda. So our first reflection is, all shall give as they are able. For 40 years, the people of Israel have wandered the desert as hunter-gatherers. Now they've arrived in the promised land where they can settle in one place, grow crops, store excess for the future. On one hand, that gives them a degree of food security. But if there's a poor harvest, 
Future starvation remains a real possibility. So they adapt local festivals of thanksgiving that have no doubt occurred since humanity first planted seeds, harvested crops, and stored them for the future. These festivals give thanks not just for, what they're, for the food that they have, but also for God's role in bringing them out of slavery. And in Deuteronomy, God gives instructions for three feasts of thanksgiving. Passover, to remember the flight from Egypt. The Feast of Weeks, which marked the beginning of harvest where the first sheaf of barley was offered in thanksgiving. And the Feast of Tabernacles, which marked the culmination of harvest. And note in those instructions for the two harvest festivals that they were to include strangers, orphans and widows to make sure that the poor and the dispossessed were fed. For centuries, Christians have celebrated similar festivals to the Festival of Weeks. We have the Feast of Lammas, held in the first week of August. Lammas was a contraction of the words loaf mass, when farmers made a loaf of bread from the new wheat crop and donated it to their local church for the communion bread. Harvest, as we celebrate it today, has its roots in the Feast of Tabernacles. Although the tradition of decorating churches with flowers and produce was actually resurrected in Victorian times to restore thankfulness to God as part of harvest celebrations. And so for many years since, a chief part of our harvest festivals has been this nostalgic celebration of harvest home, reminiscent of those Victorian celebrations described in Thomas Hardy novels, even when the gathering in of harvest was no longer a community-wide activity. But the major part of our harvest festivals has been to give thanks by sharing what we have with those less fortunate. Until fairly recently, we gave out harvest baskets of fresh produce, often to the elderly. But whilst they were appreciated, in many cases the gift was symbolic rather than essential for people's well-being. Times have changed and we've adapted our harvest collection to be packaged and processed food, which can be stored longer and given out to those in need. The amazing collection of goods today, of which this is just a small part displayed at the front, will be going to Jedburgh and Hoyk food banks. Like food banks across Scotland, they're seeing an ever-increasing demand as the cost of living goes up, but incomes don't, whether from wages or benefits. One of the key things that I learnt for the years that I worked in the Citizen Advice Bureau is just how easily an unexpected change in circumstances can have a dramatic impact on someone's ability to manage financially. An unexpected household bill can easily destroy someone's careful budgeting and the loss of a job or a partner can be devastating. Yesterday I was reading on the BBC News website of a 64-year-old woman who had worked all her life and she'd been relatively secure financially until her partner died suddenly of cancer only a week after he'd been diagnosed. Not only did she lose his income, but the trauma of his death left her unable to work. She's now living on sickness benefit of £77 a week and is reliant on food banks to eat until such time she's either fit to return to work or unable to claim her state pension of £185 a week in two years' time. Such stories are increasingly common, and with the rapid increase in food and fuel costs, the Trussell Trust, which manages many of the food banks across the UK, provided more than 2.1 million emergency food parcels between the 1st of April 2021 and the 31st of March 2022. Of these, 832,000 were for children, and this represents an 81% increase compared to the same period five years ago. This year, especially, the increased cost of living affects us all, and some of us may have made personal sacrifices to be able to give a little to others. <laughs> but as we'll explore in a moment, harvest is a time to reflect on how we can give in all ways, and in ways that don't have financial cost as well. So in the meantime, we give thanks and praise to God for the successful harvest we've had in this country, 
for the farmers and farm workers in our community and beyond who work long hours to produce our food. For those who volunteer their time to give out goods at food banks. And we remember those parts of the world where harvests have failed or been made impossible by war. And so we sing now 230, praise God for the harvest of farm and of field in 230. <laughs> We bring the offering of wheat and all cereals, the 
potatoes and all the crops from our fields. The land has yielded its harvest, our God has blessed us. We bring the offering of the shepherd's crook, a symbol of the flocks and the herds of animals and birds that give us meat. Land of human desires, our God has blessed us. We bring the offering of flowers, fruits, berries and vegetables from orchards and gardens. The land has yielded its harvest. Our Lord has blessed us. We bring the offering of seeds for next year's crops, symbol of the trust we put in you, O God. The land has yielded its harvest. Our Lord has blessed us. We bring these tins and packets as both a symbol of the fruits of human labour and of the means by which we have strength to labour. The land has yielded its harvest, our God has blessed us. We bring the offering of an empty bowl, a symbol of harvests that fail and of those around the world who suffer from hunger and starvation. Keep us mindful of their needs and may your goodness towards us bear fruits of compassion and generosity. We bring before you our gifts of money, the reward for our labours. Bless them and guide us towards the best use in the service of your kingdom. The land has yielded its harvest. Our God has blessed us. Almighty and everlasting God, we offer you our hearty thanks for your fatherly goodness and care in giving us the fruits of the earth in their seasons. Give us grace to use them rightly, to your glory, for our own well-being and for the relief of those in need. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll see 807. <coughs> Remain seated.
Our second reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. In the boat was Zebedee, the father, mending the nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And carrying on to chapter 33, 13. If I can find it. Reading from verse 31. Another parable he put before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Thank you, Fraser. Our second reflection is We Seeds, Big Trees. William Wilberforce, the campaigner for the abolition of the slave trade, said, Things great have small beginnings. Every downpour is just a great raindrop. Every fire is just a spark. Every harvest is just a seed. Every journey is just a step, because without that step, there will be no journey. Without that raindrop, there can be no shower. Without that seed, there can be no harvest. At the time of Christ, it's estimated around 90% of a person's time would have been spent producing and preparing food. Growing crops or tending livestock was part of almost everyone's everyday life. And that's why agricultural images feature so strongly as illustrations in Jesus' parables. Harvest, of course, begins with seeds. And even the tiniest of seeds has the ability to produce great crops. Jesus used the parable of the mustard seed to illustrate the great things that come from just the tiniest grain of faith. When Jesus called the disciples, he called them to participate in his mission. This wasn't something he was going to achieve alone. His disciples would be left with the task to spread the Gospels to all nations. But during their time with Jesus before his death and resurrection, they often struggled to understand the things he did and said. And this parable was told just to the disciples as a follow-on from his explanation to them of the parable of the sower. And although Jesus uses agricultural images, he exaggerates them to make his point stronger. The mustard seed isn't the smallest of seeds. If you've ever tried planting carrot seeds, you'll know. And it grows not into a big tree that birds can shelter in, but a small shrub. But Jesus is emphasising that through faith, we can achieve even more than that which we believe is possible. Even very small beginnings can lead to a wonderful result beyond our imagining. God's grace starts working for us in a small and seemingly insignificant way. And our efforts may seem insignificant. But the parable assures us that the final harvest from those efforts will be abundant. God's kingdom works in a different way to the world. The small and insignificant will be made greater than the powerful and the wealthy. Jesus chose ordinary people to be his disciples. 
and although they had the same doubts and struggles as we might, by faith and use of their gifts, just 12 people were able to spread the good news of Jesus from person to person until it had travelled worldwide within a relatively short space of time. Harvest is a time when we not only give thanks for food, but for the other gifts that God has given us to help us live lives to the full and to help others to learn of his love. Harvest offers us the opportunity to reflect on our gifts and just as we offer food and sustenance to others at harvest time, we use our gifts to provide for people in other ways, no matter how insignificant. The two readings we've just heard from Matthew remind us we are all called to be fishers of men. That even the tiniest of actions on our part in Jesus' name will grow beyond our imaginings. We're not asked to worry about whether our efforts are successful, noticed or honoured. God is the soil that makes our seeds grow. And God has promised even the smallest amount of faith or faithful option, action will bring lives into our life, into our community and into the world. Not only does God's seed grow into a big tree, it is a place that birds come to rest. In essence, the seeds transform into a place of rest, rest, refuge and community. The Guild's theme for this year is We Seeds and Big Trees, and it focuses on this parable. And it's a theme we're going to return to and explore further over the next year as a means of reflecting on our seeds, of preparing the ground for them, and military our faith. But perhaps next time you have a seed in your hand, look at that seed and before you plant it, maybe spend a minute pondering. That's not the tiniest of seeds, but it's small enough for me to hold. Pea seed. Imagine that, it's a symbol of your faith. What might God be saying to you in a seed? What hope does he have for your future? <coughs> what prevents the seed from sprouting? What stops us from hearing God's call? Seeds need the right conditions to grow. If I left this packet of seeds on this table, a year later there would still be a packet of seeds on this table. But we need to do things. We need to grow, put them in soil and tend them. <coughs> and that's what God's asking us to do. To think about how we can plant seeds in our lives and in our communities. So next time you have a seed in your hand, take a moment to think about the parable of the mustard seed. In the meantime, we're going to sing the hymn on the back of your order of service, which was sung at the Guild's annual gathering last week and fits in with our theme. Now, some of you, don't be alarmed if it says three and four instead of one and two. It's all to do with the way I cut and pasted. Um, so it's two verses. See the seed of faith once planted.
final lesson comes from the second book of Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread, and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God through the testing of this ministry. You glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ, and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others, while they long for you pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Our final reflection is hands, heads and heart. In the beginning there was nothing and out of nothing you fashioned a universe so vast, so unimaginable, that we could only sigh with amazement when we stare upwards on a starlit night. And within this universe you positioned the earth and populated it, provided for it, and designed for it to be a place of beauty. Creator God, we thank you. In the beginning there was just potential, the seed within the packet, soil's nutrients, sunshine's warmth, rain clouds gathering, and within the tiny seed, all that is our daily bread encoded, primed, and ready, should it be planted and allowed to grow. Creator God, we thank you. In the beginning, there was humankind placed within your garden, made steward, gardener, and caretaker of this place of beauty, given responsibilities and the capacity to enjoy. And yet, among the seeds we have sown, have been weeds and crops of our own choosing, which have not shown fruit or have spread and shown us the earth. Creator God, forgive us. So we're going to spend a few moments thinking about our seeds, our gifts. Rubus Law Congregation has recently begun looking at this and how they can use time and talents to serve the community. It's a process that's going to be continuing throughout the year as part of the stewardship campaign. Bob Kirk and South Dean, this is heads up that you're going to be doing the same at your next Kirk session. So, take heed. <laughs> so, you've all been wondering why you've been given a little person. So, we're spending a few minutes thinking about the different gifts that each of us bring. And as we have a huge variety of harvest gifts, each of us has different gifts that we bring to life, to church and to our community. We have gifts of the head, which is knowledge or information that you have, things you know about, enjoy talking about, or teaching others about. Anne's been teaching everyone her singing. Um, Graham, if you catch him, will teach you endless things about wildlife, whether you like it or not. And I'm sure you all have lots of things that maybe other people don't know about. Then there's gifts of the hand, practical skills that you can do. We have all these amazing flower arrangements that people did yesterday, um, which make the church look fantastic today. Carpentry, gardening, cooking. People will be cooking this afternoon at the um, South Dean Harvest Lunch. So there's gifts of the hand, and there's gifts of the heart. These are your passions or skills, listening, things you care deeply about, protecting the environment or music or children. So, You'll be pleased to know you're not drawing, unless you really want to. But on your outline, spend a few minutes, you can consult with your neighbour, um, and see if you can think of gifts of 
head, hand and heart for yourself and perhaps prompt the person next to you, um, you know, if they've got some gifts and talents that you think they're hiding under um, a bushel, um, then, and it's just a bit of time to, to reflect and give thanks to God. So, I will give you a few minutes now. You should all have, hopefully, one of these and a pencil. Empathy. 
So we have a huge amount of, of different skills and thoughts um, about what we have to offer. And not one person has all of those skills. But as Romans tells us, we're one body made of, of different parts. And each of these gifts are part of the one body. And together, as a community, we're made to love God and love our neighbours. And over the next year, we're going to really think hard about what gifts we have and how we can use them in this post-COVID, hopefully post-COVID season, where we're really starting to reach out and life's kind of returning to some kind of, of normal. It's time to really think what we are as Christians, what gifts God has given us, and how we can sow our seeds for the good of the whole community. There's an old Korean proverb, if you plant a bean, then you will harvest only beans, not grapes or strawberries. God gave us new life through Jesus Christ and planted special seeds of forgiveness and love and all sorts of gifts in our heart. So it's a time to think, what fruit are we going to bear in our daily lives? We'll have a short prayer. God of harvest, gardener supreme, you place us at the centre, you feed us, equip us, and having provided for us, look to a different harvest, a fruitfulness of lives in service to you and others. Sometimes the seeds of hope are buried within hearts which are cold, lacking in courage or lacking in faith. God of harvest, feed us, prune us, harvest us, that our lives might bring glory to you. Amen. And as for your bits of paper, I think it'd be quite good if I just leave them on the best of your table and I'll sort of type them up and gives us something to, to reflect on over the coming weeks. And now we sing 523, Hands to Work and Feet to Run. <laughs> Lord, we praise you for the harvest of talents in this church, for buildings well maintained, for flower arrangements and music, for responsible stewardship, for charities supported and people helped. We praise you for the harvest of fellowship, for friends made and support given, for people with whom to laugh and with whom to weep. Lord, we praise you for the harvest of prayer in this place, for commitment deepened, for discipleship taken up, for the cross carried and the burdens borne. Lord God, we give our thanks. 
God, the beginning and end of all things, in your providence and care, you watch unceasingly over all creation. We offer our prayers that in us and in all your people your will may be done, according to your wise and loving purpose in Christ our Lord. We pray for all through whom we receive sustenance and life, for farmers and agricultural workers, for packers, distributors and company boards. So you have so ordered our life that we depend upon each other. Enable us by your grace to seek the well-being of others before our own. We pray for all engaged in research to safeguard crops against disease, to produce abundant life among those who hunger and whose lives are at risk. Prosper the work of their hands and the searching of their minds, that their labour may be the welfare of all. We pray for governments and aid agencies, for areas of the world where there is disaster, drought and starvation. By the grace of your Spirit, touch our hearts and the hearts of all who live in comfortable plenty and make us wise stewards of your gifts. We pray for those who are ill, remembering those in hospital, nursing homes and all who are known to us. We pray for all who care for them, give skill and understanding to all who work for their well-being. We remember those who have died, those whom we entrust to your eternal love in the hope of resurrection to new, to new life. Lord of all peace, hear our prayer. We offer ourselves to your service, asking that by the Spirit at work in us, others may receive a rich harvest of love and joy and peace. Love of, Lord of all faithfulness, hear our prayer. God of grace, as you are ever at work in your creation, so fulfil your wise and loving purpose in us and in all for whom we pray, that with them in on the, and in all that you have made, your glory may be revealed, and the whole earth give praise to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll close our worship singing 231 for the fruits of all creation. Thank you.
hope, peace and joy wherever you go. And as you go, may the blessing of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore.